uh, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening. Um, let me start with introducing myself. I'm a researcher on energy and climate policies at ECN, a research institute in the Netherlands about um, energy and energy policy. And um, we work together in the European, European Union uh, Odyssey MUR project, which has been running for over 20 years. And we collect data about energy consumption in all different uh, economic sectors and data about uh, energy consuming activities. And also uh, data on policy measures to uh, improve energy efficiency. And we use the data on activities and energy to calculate energy efficiencies uh, for sectors. Um, my, my background is, um, is energy efficiency more than ETS. But um, of course, if you uh, look at developments of energy efficiency, you are also interested in um, policies and measures influencing this efficiency. So in uh, the policy brief that is uh, behind this presentation, I focused on the effects of the ETS of, uh, on energy efficiency in industry. Now, I think everybody will be um, familiar with the ETS, the Emission Trading Scheme, but uh, let me uh, go through it briefly. The idea, of course, is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by putting a price on the emissions. And the ETS has an EU-wide cap on total emissions, uh, not all emissions, I must say, but the uh, large um, emitters. And uh, the cap uh, on total emissions is uh, translated into uh, a fixed amount of tradable allowances. Now, the idea is that if you trade these allowances, that the most cost-effective uh, emission reduction measures will be taken to uh, reduce CO2 emissions. Now, it started all very promising, maybe, uh, with the prices, allowance prices around 20 euros per ton. They peaked uh, a year later, I believe, in 2006, and uh, unfortunately, they are now down to around 5 euros per ton. So, well, I suspected that the uh, effects would be limited with current prices. But of course, you can suspect uh, some things, but it's better to look at the numbers and see if your um, expectation is correct. Um, as already uh, told, ETS participants are mainly large industry and the power sector. And um, there have been different phases of the ETS. Um, and in the current phase, the allowances for the power sector are all auctioned. So the, the power sector has to pay for all uh, emission allowances. Uh, ETS industry, for a large part, still gets free allowances to um, uh, prevent problems with international competition and so-called carbon leakage of sectors outside the European Union. Um, the database of Odyssey um, focuses on energy consumption in end-use sectors. Um, so this means that industry is covered. Uh, activities and energy consumption of industry are in the Odyssey database. But power plants and refineries are not covered. So um, Odyssey data will not help to uh, study the effects of the ETS on these uh, sectors. Uh, so all I look at now is the effect of ETS on industry, uh, energy efficiency in industry. If you analyze energy efficiency, the uh, most accurate way is to um, compare production in physical quantities with the amount of energy used. So uh, tons of um, steel, for example, and, and other products. Well, Odyssey does not um, have these uh, physical production quantities for all sectors. It does contain data for the steel, glass, cement, and paper industries. 
but the other ones are um, uh, the, the production quantities of other sectors are represented by um, monetary uh, figures. So I started to um, analyze the uh, effects of ETS uh, in this way by looking at the sectors that have physical production quantities. But unfortunately, I could not find any effect of the start of the ETS or of the price developments of the ETS after it started. So then I decided to um, use all data of all industries, so not only with physical production data, but also with uh, monetary production data of all EU countries. So really uh, all uh, European industry combined together. So this is um, what the development looked like uh, starting from 1995. The blue line uh, shows an index that starts at 100 of the production volume. So again, a mixture of physical and monetary uh, data about production volumes. The red line uh, shows the energy consumption index. So it's clear that the uh, production in industry uh, rose, at least, uh, until the crisis in 2007 and 2008, um, but energy consumption remained uh, quite stable. And during the crisis, production went down sharply and energy consumption followed this uh, same development. And if you use these two lines to um, calculate an energy efficiency index, you see that the slope is quite gradual. It's yeah, quite smooth. There are no clear peaks to be seen. So um, yeah, I already uh, told what's on this sheet, actually. Um, if you um, do not look at the uh, energy efficiency index, but uh, calculate a savings rate, an annual savings rate from it, then the, uh, you get a bit more insight because there are more clear differences. And that's what we will see on the next slide. Here I have shown two lines, one with um, the year-on-year -year energy savings rate, the red line. It is actually a derivative of the uh, energy efficiency curve that I showed in the uh, previous uh, chart. So we see that uh, the year-on-year -year energy savings rate was quite high uh, during the late 90s uh, and, and peaked in 1999 and again rose in 2005 until 2007, and then with the crisis, the energy savings rate went down sharply again. The blue line shows the um, allowance price, the, the average uh, annual allowance price for uh, uh, emissions. Um, what we see here is that the um, uh, savings rate the red line went down before the uh, emission allowance price went down. So you could say um, that the uh, allowance price uh, is maybe not a main driver of the energy efficiency uh, uh, rate, savings rate. At, at first sight, well, let's let's go back to the previous slide to to look at it again. Um, you could think that um, the year-on-year uh, -year savings rate between 2005 and 2007 uh, would be related to the relatively high uh, annual uh, allowance price, because the savings rate went down before the allowance price did. That's probably um, another reason for it, and. I suspect that it is the high economic growth 
uh, during the years before the crisis, there is uh, a more probable cause of the high energy savings than the uh, allowance price. Because during times of economic growth, um, investments are higher and equipment is replaced or new equipment is installed that is uh, almost always more efficient than older equipment. But of course, um, it's also interesting to know um, how the emission allowance price uh, relates to the total energy price. So in the next chart, I have also added the uh, gas wholesale price, including the allowance price uh, per cubic meter of natural gas. So if you compare the two, then you see that the well the allowance price only adds a small fraction to the uh, total uh, gas price. Now it could again be that the expectations in 2005 um, was that allowance prices would rise and also that gas prices would rise. If we go back again and have a look at the chart, you see that the gas price was uh, going up uh, from 2004 and to 2008. But again, savings went down uh, at the start of the crisis in 2007, uh, despite the fact that the uh, gas prices were still rising. So this also uh, supports the, uh, the uh, idea that it's more the economic crisis that uh, caused uh, lower energy savings than that it had anything to do with uh, allowance or total energy prices. So what could be an explanation of the limited effect of the ETS on energy efficiency? Um, well, one of the uh, well-known uh, causes is that the amount of allowances is not changed in response to changes in economic development. Um, if economic growth is slower than was expected, um, then you have uh, too much allowances on the markets, which cause the price to go down. Another reason is that allowances that have not been used can be used later. This is called banking. So um, in economic um, downturns, of course, you uh, there are a lot of allowances that you're not using, and you can keep them for later. Companies that compete internationally receive free allowances. We already discussed this. Um, this does, of course, not mean that it doesn't have a value. It, you can still earn money by saving energy, and then the allowances that you uh, uh, do not use, you can uh, sell them on the market, so they still have a value. But it's still a different situation than if uh, industries would have to buy all emission allowances themselves. Another reason is that the amount of free allowances um, was based, uh, that, that, that industries got, individual industries, was based on estimates of industrial production volumes before the crisis. So that means that individual uh, companies also uh, received too much uh, more allowances than they needed to cover their production. Um, another thing is large-scale application of flexibility mechanisms, uh, joint implementation with uh, um, uh, other countries outside the EU, or the clean development mechanism with the developing uh, countries. And you can earn uh, allowances so uh, by doing projects in this way, and this means there is still a larger uh, amount of allowances that is on the market. There's also interaction with other policies. Um, of course, uh, the EU and EU countries also had energy efficiency policies and renewable energy targets that they worked on. And the more uh, effective these policies are, uh, the less allowances are needed. And 
what is especially after Paris, uh, a very important thing to note is that the amount of allowances is higher than the cumulative emissions that are in accordance with the long-term decarbonization targets of the EU. Um, the current rate at which the ceiling goes down, uh, I believe it's around 1.7% annually, uh, means that if you add all these uh, amounts up until 2050, the total amount of allowances is uh, emissions that is allowed, I can better say, is too high to stay below the 2 degrees centigrade that uh, was agreed during the Paris Agreement. Well, what would be the options to increase the effect of the ETS on uh, energy efficiency in industry? I think you can divide it in two main approaches. Um, the first is a focus on price. Well, that makes sense in the market situation. Um, but not just uh, a raising of the price, but also make sure that the price is becoming higher in a consistent way. So there's more certainty uh, about the price level. Uh, also during economic downturns. Uh, so you would have to think about what is a, a minimum price that would be high enough to uh, result in, in higher energy efficiency. Now another main approach could be to uh, focus on not so much on the price but on the yearly availability of allowances. Because if no allowances are available, no emissions will occur. So what are the options to increase the effect? Um, if you well, look at the options that these two main approaches uh, offer. Of course you can remove allowances from the market. This is, this will raise the price and this is already addressed by the market stability reserve but this is now only uh, done temporarily so they can uh, come out of the reserve again if um, the uh, if the prices would be too high according to um, the people that decide about this and the goal is uh, more price stability than removing allowances uh, forever. You can also remove allowances forever uh, from the market whenever a large emission source disappears uh, as a result of other policies. For example, if a member state would decide to close a coal power plant, then they can um, remove the uh, associated allowances from the market. So then you would not have this um, uh, water bed effect that people are talking about, so that if one country would close a coal uh, power plant, that uh, the emissions could still occur in other uh, EU member states. You could introduce a floor price to make sure that the price is high, always high enough. Um, well, the disadvantage is that the, uh, well, the, the, the market mechanism will be uh, abandoned, uh, partly at least and also uh, that you would have to think what a price level would be that would be really effective enough to uh, increase energy efficiency improvements. What you can also do is cancel free allowances and compensate this with other policies. Um, for example, I can imagine uh, um, changes in tax policies, for example, making labor uh, tax labor less for employers and tax uh, emissions higher. And that is, if you uh, get less free allowances, that the, the cost, uh, the associated cost, will be compensated by uh, by tax measures. You could also uh, increase the rate at which the emission ceiling goes down. Uh, as I told, it's now around 1.7% per year. The um, current proposal in the European Parliament is, I think, 2.2%. Uh, 
um, but it's still not enough. Um, so there was talk about raising it to 2.4 percent per year, but I don't think it has been accepted by Parliament. Um, relating to the uh, the Paris Agreement, what you should do if you take the Paris Agreement serious, as countries have done because they have signed the Paris Agreement, is that you make sure that the uh, cumulative allowances that are available from now until 2050 are not higher than the uh, maximum heating that is accepted. We want to stay below 2 degrees. It is possible to calculate how many uh, how much emissions are compatible with staying below this level. Of course, you have to um, um, calculate how you divide these targets between different sections of the world. But if you, and, and there's some variation in how you uh, divide these uh, between Europe and, and the rest of the world. But there are some accepted ways of doing this, and you, this way you can calculate the maximum number of allowances that should be on the market. And the current amount of allowances is higher than uh, the amount that is compatible with pairs. So it would be a good idea to cancel this surplus if you really are serious about uh, meeting this Paris agreement target. And finally, um, you could limit the amount of allowances that may be banked, because I think that commercial companies often focus on short-term goals, and maybe they um, have a tendency to postpone measures, because maybe they uh, uh, find short-term goals more important, or they hope that some technology will appear in a few years' time and, and, and um, can still take measures later. I think it would be better for uh, to 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 somehow um, come to a more gradual way of reducing emissions if you limit banking and make sure that in each year the available allowances go down so that you're that, that emitting parties are forced more than they are now to take measures now or soon, and that uh, postponing measures will be uh, more difficult. So I already come to the conclusion, in even within half an hour. Unfortunately, well, it was uh, in accordance with what I expected. An effect of the ETS on energy efficiency improvement in manufacturing industry in the EU cannot be clearly derived from Odyssey data. Um, it could be that there was an effect, uh, maybe because of market expectations between 2005 and 2007. But I strongly believe that economic growth during these years had a larger effect than the allowance prices. And to incentivize energy efficiency measures in industry, allowance prices should increase substantially and consistently. Uh, so there's more certainty about prices. Or the yearly availability of allowances should be limited in a, in, in a more gradual and also predictable way. And that can be done by gradually reducing the amount, the annual amount of available allowances in a way that is compatible with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And I think it's important that we try to really uh, achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement. So thank you. That's it. Uh, thank you for your attention.